Hello, everyone. Welcome back to ECOTS 2020. We're now going to be moving on to Tuesday's hot topics. So we're going to be talking about activities related to Dollar Street for the first 15 minutes with Jade Smith and Aaron Freeman. And then we will move on to talking about engaging everyone with clickers with Carrie Lock Morgan during the second 15 minutes of the session. So first of all, I want to uh, give the introductory bios uh, for Jade and Erin. So Jade Smith is an assistant teaching professor in the Department of Mathematical Sciences at Montana State University. She earned her MS degree in statistics at Montana State in 2012. For the past seven years, Jade has served as the student success coordinator of the Introduction to Statistics Coordinated Course. She helped to overhaul the Introduction to Statistics Coordinated Course to focus on a simulated based curriculum using technology enhanced active learning pedagogy. Erin Freeman is an associate professor of psychology at the University of Oklahoma, where she serves as a master teacher of undergraduate statistics. Each semester, she teaches introductory statistics to approximately 400 students the majority of whom are psychology, pre-med, or nursing majors. She is also responsible for coordinating and supervising the graduate instructors who are assigned to teach an additional 100 to 200 students and for developing a standardized curriculum for all sections of the course. So Erin, I'd like to start asking you some questions. Hello. So how did you get started using Dollar Street and how would you recommend that uh, our viewers and audience participants get started using Dollar Street? Uh, with Dollar Street, it happened in different ways. Um, originally, I started using Gapminder, just the, a, the straight Gapminder um, site in my class for a lot of visual descriptions. And then through Gapminder, I learned about Dollar Street. Um, and then actually reading through uh, CauseWeb, I learned more about Dollar Street. Um, and so that's how I first got introduced to Dollar Street. And then I, I watched the TED Talk by Anna Rosling and got some ideas in that um, respect. Um, but in terms of how um, our reader or our participants can uh, get started with Dollar Street too, I think that just having students start exploring it themselves, I found that um, anybody that I introduced the website to, there are they get engaged very, very quickly. And so I've tried to uh, find ways that I can create questions for my students. I know that um, one of the participants had asked specifically about in an online environment. And um, I use discussion boards in all of my stats classes, both face-to-face -face and online. And I think there's really um, creative ways that you can get students to uh, start engaging with the material at a very simple level, but uh, that gets their brain sort of statistically minded. So for example, um, I might have students go on and um, just ask questions or notice relationships, notice, notice things, and then um, put those things that they notice into the discussion board. And then I challenge other students to start um, thinking about those confounding variables or uh, additional things that, that they might notice. Um, I've thought about having them, um, you know, just, yeah, play around with just different ideas. And, and so just at the very beginning, just get students engaged with the material and to uh, start noticing those variables before really um, bringing them to a higher level. All right, great, great. Jay, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I don't know that I do. I had a very similar uh, start to Dollar Street and uh, through that Gapminder website. And we actually used to have students watch the Hans Rosling video of like the 200 countries over 200 years. So that was kind of our intro video for students um, to Gapminder. And so now uh, seeing them play around with Dollar Street, I think, and, and really just play around with the site, show them the features of the site. I think you can do that in an online environment where you're not face to face by kind of creating just an intro video and then letting them explore. I think it's a very user friendly website. I think students would have a lot of fun just playing around with everything and, and seeing how things change as you move across Dollar Street and looking at all those dip different topics. I think the fact that there are, you know, 125 different types of variables, if you want to think about it that way, that students find something that's interesting to them and are able to explore that in more depth. Yeah, and I think it's really nice that there's uh, the TED Talk to go along with that to add some context as well. Absolutely. So I want to remind everyone that 
this is your opportunity to ask more additional questions to Aaron and Jade. So please post those in the question and answer board. In the meantime, Jade, I'll start with you this time. Yeah. So what are some of the best practices that can be used to facilitate learning about multivariable thinking using Dollar Street in an online environment? So I think actually Aaron's activity worked really well for looking at multivariable thinking there where you can have students uh, record it, it, just extending what Aaron was doing with her students, have students record more than one variable. So looking at uh, even if they're looking at the same topic, if they're looking at hands, they can record whether they're decorative uh, as well as whether they're wearing any kind of jewelry or not. Um, if you're looking at pets, you could talk about how many pets are shown. Um, if you're looking at a quantitative variable in conjunction with looking at what type of pet is shown. So I think those kind of things um, would really lend themselves well to looking at a multivariable situation that would involve a little bit more work on the students in terms of data entry. I think the Dollar Street data set, if you actually download it, really only includes two variables, which is country of origin and income level for the family. But you could add on to that for those families that you selected. Um, we specifically use the Dollar Street more as a holistic view of like what's happening globally. And to reiterate uh, Anna Rosling's comments about the fact that there are greater differences across income levels than across countries within the same income level. So um, our idea of multivariable data exploration is really using the Gapminder data where you have, you know, so many different variables that the students can look at. Um, and that's why we, we kind of compare that. Again, it's actually going back to Hans Rosling's video about care pairing income with life expectancy across different years and looking at population data as well. Very interesting. And Aaron, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, no, no I, I think that is an awesome idea. And I think that um, it's specifically with the online, I think any way you can, again, try to um, challenge the students or just engage them to maybe compare things. So kind of like what Jade was saying, if you constrain you know, maybe the income levels for each student and have them compare, find similarities within variability or within groups or between groups or different things like that and um, have that opportunity. Another thing that's uh, not really specific to Dollar Street, but more about how I uh, implement things online um, for me, which I know people have different opinions about this, but I um, have found that if I can make it sort of a game in the discussion board somehow that students can be a little bit more, um, they just do better usually. And so um, I know at another conference um, recently, I, I learned about something called Wheel Decide, which is like a, a wheel of fortune wheel that embeds on your uh, um, canvas or whatever. And so I found that, you know, if I put different variables on there that students can click that in the discussion port. And so like with Dollar Street, it could choose a variable for them and that could encourage them to you know, I don't know, you could do many different things with it, but instead of saying, hey, you're going to look at Cambodia or you're going to look at pets, just having in an online environment, having that um, fun, the thrill of what is the will going to decide um, can make things a little bit more engaging for students in some ways. A little bit more of a surprise in the discussion question rather than just kind of flat. Exactly. Mm -hmm. One of the things I like about Dollar Street is um, it brings students out of their, their street and has them uh, challenge what they consider for others in a very broad way. Uh, so, and your activities really enhance that to have them look at that. So we have a question, um, in your use of Dollar Street, did you introduce new topics that you might not normally cover since students are being confronted directly with the fact that data aren't always numbers? I would say for us, um, yes, absolutely. Um, just talking about, again, that holistic global look of comparing within income level across country versus comparing within country across income level. That's more of a almost psychological aspect of the course that we wouldn't necessarily bring in um, that we brought in as, in response to Dollar Street. Um, and then I would also talk about the ways that we are currently um, using data, like in like I talked about in, in Stacy's and my talk, the innovations with self-driving cars and, and parking assist and 
um, lane warnings, like when you're changing lanes and, and that kind of thing, all of that new technology that's being introduced right now and how that uses uh, visualizations as data as opposed to just the numbers and the summary statistics. Yeah, I agree. I am, um, of course, ours is a psych stats course um, by name. So we, we talk a lot about the sort of implications of data and statistics and how it's used. And so, you know, sometimes I'll encourage students to uh, maybe think outside the box, like as journalists and maybe what kind of headlines might people maybe incorrectly make, and then how can they sort of use statistical thinking to break that down? And so while we're staying within the topics of statistics and all the different ideas that go into interpreting results, um, Dollar Street allows students to, to think a lot more about sort of the information that they're receiving um, daily. And so we do talk about that. We talk about the ethics related to um, data, but in terms of the, the pictures, it's just another way for them to understand that there's all sorts of types of data that you use to um, make decisions and to understand the world. We had uh, someone asked about uh, the, a link for the wheel. Do you have, happen to know what that is for the wheel of? Um, I can let you know. If you literally Google wheel decide, like W-H-E-E-L-D-E-C-I-D-E, -E -E, and I can try to do it too. Um, it will, um, I guess it's just wheeldecide.com. Okay. It, it embeds in your, um, you can, I use Canvas, so I'm not 100% sure about all the others, but I'm 99% sure that it works in any of them. Uh, you can embed it right into your discussion post. Okay, so I'm going to post that in, although I'm uh, sure it worked for me to Google it. So if you don't remember otherwise, you can try that. But uh, so that's posted in there now. And uh, so we have one question left. And so uh, this participant says, I shared this website with my department and got flack for the website being a bad source of data. Um, and additionally, is it my imagination that all of the poor families on the page are those of color was the comment. How would you respond to that? And I'll, you let me know who you'd like to go first. I'll, I'll talk. Um, I mean, okay. <laughs> I'll think and then I'll, I'll hand it over to Jade. I mean, I haven't really thought about it. So, I mean, I think one thing is important is that it's important. And I try to tell students that all data has different limitations. And so I think to point out that, you know, yes, there is sampling. Um, it's a non-probabilistic sampling technique, but I don't necessarily think that makes it bad data. I think that it's um, a great way to demonstrate different data and there's a lot of data there while acknowledging that there are, um, it's not a randomized sample, you know, it is a very small sample, but I think in terms of teaching especially, that's just another way to um, discuss these things with students and, and to discuss the um, limitations of the inferences you can, can make, but I think it still makes it a really great teaching tool. In terms of um, the, it being mostly people of color on the low end of the income, that is true, honestly. Um, I, I guess I'm, I mean, other than looking at the different countries and comparing that, I haven't, I'm gonna let Jade handle that one and, and <laughs> think about it, I'll think. Yeah, too. being yeah. from Montana, I have a lot of, I have a lot of familiarity with this. No, um, <laughs> so. <laughs> So what I would say is one thing I'm not clear about and something that I wanted to look more into Dollar Street is I know that all of the incomes that are reported, in other words, the where you're labeled on Dollar Street is converted to US dollars. That being said, I'm not sure if it's converted to cost of living or just the relative US dollar rate. Um, certainly the cost of living in many other countries would not be the same um, as what we would experience here in the US. Uh, so I, I would say that's something to consider in terms of where people fall on Dollar Street is whether the cost of living is taken to, into account when that monthly income is reported and where they're labeled on the Dollar Street. Um, and that being said, I mean, I, like it, it is factual that the income levels in third world countries are lower than the income levels here. Um, in the U.S. or in more advanced European countries, you know, that that is a fact. Like, I don't know that that necessarily makes it bad data. It just makes people more aware of, of a fact that is true around the world. Yeah. 
Well, thank you both uh, for answering the, uh, all of our questions today, for coming back a second time. We really, really appreciate this opportunity to ask you some additional questions. And now we're going to uh, switch over to the clicker questions. So Carrie Locke Morgan uh, received her PhD in statistics from Harvard University and is now an assistant professor of statistics at Penn State University. Her primary research interests are causal inference and statistics education. She was the 2018 recipient of the National Robert B. Hogue Award for Excellence in Teaching Introductory Statistics. Thank you for coming back. We're so glad you're here. We're going to answer some additional questions. And then, um, but as you're listening to these, uh, please post any questions that you may have in the Q&A board for Carrie uh, so that we can get to them during this session. So one of the first questions was, and I want to start with this one. It's actually one of the third one, the third one in the list that I talked to you about was how to adapt these activities to the online environments. Since so many of us are thinking that we either know or we're thinking that's where we're headed uh, in the next few months. Yeah, so that's a, a really great question. Um, so I think it depends on whether you're doing asynchronous or synchronous online classes, and the answer will will differ a lot depending on that. Um, I'll start with synchronous first because that's the easiest in some sense. So it's so in synchronous classes, if you're using Zoom, it's really easy to create poll questions and students answer them just as you've been doing throughout this conference. The poll question pops up. Students have, don't have to do anything, have anything, plan anything. They just click on the multiple choice question and you can share the results just as you would as if they were sitting with clickers in class. Um, I only know Zoom, but I'm assuming other things have similar features. The only little catch is you have to create poll questions ahead of time, um, but then you can just load them whenever you're ready for them. And it's pretty pretty seamless and pretty easy. It's actually a great way to get into clicker questions if you haven't used them before. Um, so that's synchronous. Of course, that doesn't work if it's asynchronous because that requires everyone to be there at the same time. Um, asynchronous, I personally don't have experience with, but I know other people who have created videos that have embedded clicker questions that students have to answer and get feedback on before they move forward. So I think that would be the way to incorporate clickers in an asynchronous environment. I'm going to post two links for doing this. Disclaimer, I haven't used them myself, but I have heard other people that have used them, at least the first one, and worked well. Um, the first is Kaltura, and I've given the link that takes you right to how to do interactive video quizzes. And the second one is Vizia, which I haven't heard of before, but it looks pretty awesome from a quick Google Google search. So there's at least two options that allow you to create videos that have embedded clicker questions for the students. Yeah, Camtasia does that as well, as okay. well as Mediasite. Great. Uh, so uh, is there a library of clicker questions? Um, yes. So, so the most extensive one that I know of, I'm going to go ahead again and, and paste it in the chat, um, is from Carroll College. I just pasted it there. It has, it takes you to a lot of math questions, but there is a statistics link that has a lot of statistics questions um, from a lot of different people. So that is a statistics library. I also, people have been asking about it during the session. Sessions, so I'm just going to go ahead and post. Um, this is my particular course, which has everything, but if you want a lot of, um, this happens to be a biostat course, but if you want general questions for introductory statistics, there's a lot of um, questions there embedded in my slides. I know we all we provide clicker questions um, with our textbook, the LOC5 book, but I'm sure we're not the only ones. So I'm guessing if you look into the resources for whatever textbook you're using, you're likely to find clicker questions um, tailored to your um, textbook. Um, yeah, so that's, that's some ideas. So those are great ideas and resources. I'll go check some of those out myself. Um, if as you're writing questions, are there any tips that you might give if you decide you, you need one on this particular topic and you can't seem to find one? Yeah, so I think in developing your own questions, I think um, conceptual and things that students don't have to do a lot of work to get to the answer to tends to be better. So things that require the students to think a little bit, but does, don't require them to um, do a whole long involved analysis because students take a lot of different time, amounts of time doing that kind of thing. Um, so things that, that are more conceptual. 
Also, if you look at your lecture and you find yourself repeating something anyway, kind of paraphrasing or giving a second example, um, that's a perfect opportunity to replace that repetition with a clicker question. Um, so not necessarily adding new material, but replacing some of the repetition that, that hopefully you have built in anyway with clicker questions. Yeah, so you're, you're keeping the length roughly the same, but um, just getting maybe some more active thinking. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, Penn State stated last fall that the clicker box system would be discontinued. So do you know what's next? I mean, so, <laughs> so I'm sad about that. Um, I didn't know that until until Jenny told me. So thank you, Jenny. Um, so so I know at, um, at when I was at Duke before this, we had to bring our bring along our own clicker box. So there wasn't one in the classroom. Um, but if clicker boxes go away entirely, I know there are a lot of other alternatives for doing it and entirely um, online through smartphones or computers. I'm not excited about asking students to get out their phones, but but I think it's certainly better than nothing if, if that's the only the only option, although I'm sure Everybody likes using clickers and boxes. So many people, I'm sure if, even if iClicker does away with it, I'm sure another company will, will try to fill that void. So I think we have to just wait and see what, what's the next latest and greatest idea there. Right, how technology shifts as we shift with it. Exactly. Was there anything that you really wanted to add to your presentation, but just couldn't because of time? Um, let me... I didn't think through that in advance. <laughs> so yeah, me, sorry. I'm, 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 I'm trying to, to think for a second. Um, also, I will say, I, didn't, I don't want this to be just me answering. So if any, any of you have used clickers, feel free to type in the chat or to, to raise your hand. This, this hopefully is a more interactive discussion. So anyone can feel free to not just ask questions, but to make um, comments. I'm sure many of you have used clickers and just have just as much um, expertise to share as I have. So I guess that's one, it's kind of a cop out answer, but that's one thing that I would have liked to have more time for in my session is more um, people, some people answered other, some more time for other people to get to share um, what they're doing with clickers and maybe they have other ideas that I, that I didn't share. So Roxy shared something. I don't know if yeah. you, it you want to read it, Megan. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So we have um, um, a, a comment from Roxy. So another clicker question tip, if you want to use them to inform instruction, write the distractor so that they represent common student errors and thinking and know what you will do as an instructor if a large number of students go for a wrong answer. That's a good tip. Very good tip. Great. Thanks, Roxy. So all of yep. you out there, feel free to feel free to chat in order to raise your hand. I'd love to hear what what all of you have to say as well. Yeah, so I have it, I believe, so I can see if you raise your hand. So um, just let us know if you want to do that. There was a, also another comment in the chat uh, before Roxy's. Uh, use Nearpod. Uh, you can use it too. It allows you to survey students during the lecture. I haven't heard of that one, but it's another option. There's so many options out there that even if the iClicker boxes go away, there's, there's so many options that there will be something that, that we can use. Thank you. Okay, so here we have a question in the Q&A box. Uh, for students who are online this fall, who, who would have otherwise chosen a face-to-face -face course, would you recommend synchronous or asynchronous? Do you know of any research on this topic? So that's really funny because I submitted this exact question to the um, panel on online learning. Like I literally submitted that. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering the same thing myself. Um, I don't know of any research, but um, if anyone has expertise, I, I have never taught online until this March. and I was kind of thrown in the deep end. So I'm the wrong person to ask. Um, but if anyone wants to chime in, um, please do. I, I did a synchronous class. I just kind of continued my class in person, um, but I don't have any experience with asynchronous, so I really am not the right person to answer this question. I'm sorry. Others can feel free to, to drive, to jump in. So I asked around a lot for my students on this question, uh, for um, around the, the different centers for teaching and learning at the University of Florida. And most of them said that due to the upheaval at that time, many students preferred asynchronous. That being said, I got an email this morning that our entire college is required to do synchronous. So I think it's still quite up in the air. 
That's funny. At Penn State, we were, we were required to do synchronous in the fall. We were tried, required to keep the class as similar as possible for a sense of continuity. So different universities have different, different takes on this. Yeah, so uh, Jade had a comment. Um, oh, I lost the comment. She said, we use synchronous delivery and most students felt very positive about the experience. Yeah, I have the same approach, but I mean, I have the same feeling, but I don't have the op opposing opinion. Opposing experience. So uh, a question here for students. Oh, wait, I just did that one. Uh, Eric says, some people use the paper clicker where students hold up a colored sheet that gives an A, B, C, or D. What is the primary benefit of an electric clicker where the results are displayed live versus a non-electric version where only the instructor sees the responses? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think the primary benefit of clickers is not actually the electronic um, gathering of responses, but is the students actually thinking real time. So whether you use electronic clickers or whether you use paper holding up different colors, I think you're getting the primary benefit of clickers um, either way. I tend to use electronic um, partly because I think it's helpful for students to see the gathered responses. It's helpful for them to know where they stand as a class. Um, I, I also use it, um, it's part of their grade, so it provides some encouragement for students to come to class, which, which you can't do if it's not, they're not clicking in. Um, but I, I really think the primary benefit you get across either way, whether using paper or clickers. So here's some more comments about synchronous and asynchronous. So this is great. So um, I found my interest as students dropped off in participation in my initially asynchronous course after switching it to online. I surveyed the students and they overwhelmingly wanted to revert to a synchronous format. I recorded everything for students who couldn't make it. I definitely worked better once I switched over. That's great, thank you. Uh, so some more comments. Uh, the nice thing about synchronous is the interaction with students and recording it in Zoom gives the ability to watch it later. And I'll say one other thing that I've loved um, during, during synchronous. Um, I was going to save this for the next hot topic, so stay tuned if you want to. Um, but I found breakout rooms have been phenomenal, um, both for engaging students, but for allowing students to talk to each other. Um, it, it randomizes them into small groups and they have small group discussions. And I think they're lacking, really lacking peer-to-peer -peer contact these days. And that's, that's only possible in a synchronous environment, as far as I know. Um, so one more plug for synchronous. Although nothing to do with clickers. <laughs> well, here, here's a clicker one. Yeah. So um, I did use some clicker type questions using Google Forms during the synchronous portion of the class inspired by the Lock 5 book. Thanks, Carrie. Great. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. In the breakout rooms, do they have? So the breakout rooms, they don't have to have the professor prep. Sorry, I'll, I'll read. I'll let, if you want to ask the question, Megan, I'm sorry. Well, I'm ready. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so John asked, in the breakout room, do they have to have professor present? So the breakout rooms, the professor has to send them to the breakout rooms, but then the professor isn't actually physically, not physically, isn't actually present in each of the breakout rooms. You can pop in and out of them, but they don't have to have the professor present. They actually don't for the most part. Do you have a resource for asynchronous clickers or something similar? Yeah, so those, I can share those two links again because I know the links go away when people start. Um, but I shared two links, although people mentioned many more, so I don't know if it's even worth sharing. But Kaltura um, allows you to provide embedded clicker questions in videos. Vizia does. Someone said Canvas does. Um, Megan mentioned Camtasia. There's lots of options out there. Uh, pretty much any, I think, um, video pedagog video creating software with pedagogy in mind will allow you to embed interactive clicker questions in in, in videos that you share with your students um, outside of class. So as we kind of come to our last minute of clicker use, if you um, had a tip or a recommendation that you could give to people considering it, what would you what would you say? just try it. It's like the most minimal buy-in pedagogical strategy. You can ask one clicker question in one class, and if you don't like it, never do it again. Um, but it's not like overhauling your whole curriculum or anything. You can start um, just one clicker question a class if you want, or a couple for one, one class you're planning, um, and, if, and, and go from there. I would say just try it, and you'll see it's actually really easy to think of questions and students like it, but just try it. <laughs> Great. 
That sounds like great advice. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Carrie. We'll see you back here again uh, for the Thursday. Wednesday. Wednesday. So, so very soon, <laughs> back in 15 minutes for the Wednesday Hot Topic. Mm -hmm. So thank you everyone for joining us for the Tuesday Hot Topic. We'll be back in 15 minutes for the Wednesday Hot Topic. Bye. Thanks. Bye.